Hello and welcome to this talk about Eastbourne Writers. It's been an odd sort of year and it seems that one of the things we've been doing more of this year, and this is certainly true for me, is reading. Book sales have apparently increased. We're fortunate in Eastbourne in that we can choose from quite a few writers who have local connections, writing on a variety of topics and in different styles. There's lots of them and some of them are quite prolific and some of them wrote dozens of books. So I've had to be selective and forgive me if I've left out one of your favorites. One of the first issues I had to consider is who counts as an Eastbourne writer because very few of us actually spend our whole lives in one place. So I've chosen to group them in this way. I'm going to start by talking about a couple of writers who were born in Eastbourne. Then I'm going to move on to consider some who went to school here. Um, one who lived in Eastbourne as an adult. And I'm going to finish by looking at writers who were regular or even occasional visitors to the town. So I'm going to begin, as I said, with a couple of writers who were born in Eastbourne, and the first of them is Ruma Godden. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd never actually heard of Ruma Godden until we decided to read one of her books in our book group. But what I had heard of is Black Narcissus, and this was her most famous book. It was her first bestseller. It was published in 1939. And some of you might have seen the film that was made in 1947, starring Deborah Carr, Sabu, and Jean Simmons. And Black Narcissus, uh, I'll talk about Black Narcissus in a moment, uh, just a brief biography of Bruma Godden. As I said, she was born in Eastbourne in 1907, and she was one of these very prolific writers, writing about 60 books over a range of types, so adult fiction, non-fiction, poetry, and children's books. She grew up in what was then India, but is now in Bangladesh, but she was educated in England, including at Moira House. In 1920, she went back to India. She moved to Calcutta and opened a dance school. Uh, and unusually, the students there were both English and Indian. In the early 1930s, she married and moved to Kashmir. And she came back to the UK at the end of the war. She divorced and remarried. And she lived until the age of 90, spending her final years in Dumfrieshire. Now, Black Narcissus uh, illustrates many of the key themes that you find in Ruma Godden's books. First of all, the story is often gradually revealed. There's often flashbacks. So you're talking the present, then it goes to the past and so on. And this creates quite a good sense of tension in her books. She has key themes. So the disruptive influence of sexual desire, uh, treachery, misunderstanding between cultures and loss of innocence. So in Black Narcissus, for example, those of you who've seen the film, and by the time you watch this talk, some of you may have watched the BBC serialization, which is due to start just after Christmas. In Black Narcissus, a group of Anglican nuns goes to a remote area of the Himalayas in India to set up a convent with a school and a small local hospital. And gradually the nuns are seduced by the sensuousness of the area and standards begin to fall, discipline becomes a bit lax. Now, obviously, I don't want to give the plot away for those of you who are planning to read it, but into the convent comes a young local man known as the young general who comes there to be educated, and he gradually becomes infatuated by one of the serving girls. And without going into detail, uh, it all ends rather badly. Now, Ruma Godden, was very interested in Roman Catholicism later on in her life. And Black Narcissus was only one of several books which she set in convents. Two others are In This House of Greed and Five for Sorrow, Ten for Joy. Both very interesting reads. Five for Sorrow and Ten for Joy sounds very sensationalist if I describe it, because it's a story of a young woman, Lisa, Elizabeth Fanshawe, who is in Paris for the liberation in 1944. 
and she gets lost and she's taken in by this young man called Patrice, who it turns out runs a brothel. And Lisa ends up running this brothel for him. And again, without giving the plot away, she ends up in prison where she meets some sisters from the Order of Bethany. And this is a, a Catholic order which works with women in prison, some of whom, including Lisa, then go on to join the convent and become nuns themselves. Now, as I said, it sounds rather sensationist, but in fact, it's a very serious book. And there's a lot in there, and also in this House of Breed, about the nature of self-sacrifice and obedience and so on. Uh, there is a very treacherous person in Five for Sorrow, Ten for Joy. And again, this loss of innocence, this young girl who finds herself in Paris and is drawn into this really quite... Um, sordid life. Now, as you can imagine, because Ruma Godin lived in India for many years, she set several of her books there. Kingfisher's Catch Fire was based on her own experience of living in Kashmir, and this in fact was the book that we read in our book group. But I've also mentioned a couple of other titles of hers which are set in India. Now, the second author born in Eastbourne that I'm going to talk about is a complete contrast. This is Angela Carter. She was born here in 1940, although she actually spent very little of her life in, in, in Eastbourne because she was evacuated to her grandmother in Yorkshire during the war. Uh, she worked as a journalist when she left school and she went to university as a mature student studying English literature at Bristol University. She married when she was 20, uh, but by the time she was 29, she'd won the Somerset Maugham Award and um, used the money to leave her husband to move to Tokyo, which I suppose is one way you can use your prize money. She married again later on. She met Mark Pierce. He was, she describes how he was doing some work on a house opposite and she had some problem in her house and she called him in and said, would he be able to fix it? And as she said, he never left and they married and had one son. And unfortunately, Angela Carter died young of lung cancer. Now, I think the word I would use to describe Angela Carter's works is exuberant. She certainly pushed the boundaries. Um, her books are full of action, unusual creatures, and so on. I've mentioned three of them there. The Magic Toy Shop was filmed, but I want to talk a little bit about Night's Circus, which is about Sophie Feathers. And as you can see from the book cover illustration there, Sophie does indeed have feathers. And she's described as a six foot two, curvaceous peroxide blonde, hatched from an egg by unknown parents, who becomes a celebrated aerialist. So not your usual sort of heroine. She captivates a young journalist, Jack Walser, who interviews her and runs away with the circus. And they travel to St. Petersburg and to Siberia. And as you can imagine, they have lots of adventures en route. So two authors there, born in Eastbourne, very different from each other, but both with a lot to offer. Now I'm going to move on to discuss several authors who went to school in Eastbourne. Lots of uh, well-known writers went to school in Eastbourne. E.M. Forster, for example, was at school here briefly. But I'm going to begin by concentrating on several who went to St. Cyprian's School. Now, as you can see uh, on the slide, there's a picture there of the school. This no longer exists. It was burnt down by fire. At destroyed by fire. But where it was is where Gildridge House School is now, between Summerdown Road and Paradise Drive. And the house you can see in the bottom picture is on Summerdown Road, and this used to be the headmaster's house. And the current residents very kindly gave me permission to take photographs of the blue plaques on the house, which as you can see, mention a number of writers as well as Sir Cecil Beeson, who of course was well known as a photographer. <coughs> Excuse me. 
And St. Cyprian's School was founded in 1899 by Lewis Vaughan Wilkes and his wife, Cecily Comin, and moved into the, the building, which is on this slide here, in 1906. And it was a school which was based on a prevailing ethos of muscular Christianity, which put a lot of emphasis on developing self-reliance and integrity. Basically, the school was a crammer, and the idea was to get as many scholarships as possible, and they were very successful in doing this, to leading public schools. The school that they sent most students to was Harrow, but also they sent a lot of students, including George Orwell, who I'll be talking about in a moment, to Eton. But as well as cramming the boys, uh, because it was located near the South Downs, they had lots of opportunities for running wild, studying natural history, walking, picnics, riding, and golf, and so on. And St. Cyprian's produced a quite a large number of writers. Mrs. Wilkes, known as the formidable Mrs. Wilkes, taught English literature, and she emphasized the importance of clear, good writing. And several of the writers uh, credited her with developing their skills. Here we've got a list of some of the writers who are alumni of St. Cyprian's. I'm just going to be mentioning three of them, George Orwell, Gavin Maxwell, and Cyril Connolly. Beginning with George Orwell, who of course was born as Eric Arthur Blair in India in 1903. And his father worked in the opium department of the Indian Civil Service, which sounds like quite an interesting sort of job. But Orwell came to England in 1904 with his mother and two sisters, and he was a student at St. Cyprian's between 1911 and 1916. And um, he died in 1950 of TB. As I'm sure you're aware, this was before antibiotics were available and therefore his TB couldn't be treated at that time. Here's a quote from a rather nice letter which he wrote to his mother with the original spelling uh, about Mrs. Wilkes's birthday and how they had fun after tea and played games and went for a walk to Beachy Head. But in 1947, George Orwell wrote an account of his time at St. Cyprian's, a short pamphlet called Such, Such Are the Joys. And reading it, you certainly get the impression that he wasn't very happy there. Orwell was a scholarship boy. And one of the things he talks about was the snobbishness and how everybody knew he was a scholarship boy. And uh, he complains, for example, I'll talk a moment about his experience of corporal punishment, but he was fairly certain that very, very wealthy students were never corporally punish punished. But he does mention his first example of corporal punishment. The headmaster, Mr. Wilkes, used to beat the boys with a riding crop. And the first time this happened to Orwell, when it was over, as he walked out of the room, he made the mistake of saying to one of his friends, that didn't hurt very much, at which point he was immediately hauled back into the room and beaten so hard that Mr. Wilkes actually broke his riding crop. Orwell also complains about the cold. Uh, people I know who've been to public school all say it was pretty cold. And so for example, their baths were cold water. And he also talks about the lack of hygiene. So for example, the older boys went into the bath first. So by the time the younger ones got in, the water was pretty grubby. And he also complains about the food. So there wasn't very much of it for a start. One of Mr. Wilkes's maxims was, that it was as good to feel hungry at the end of a meal as it was to feel hungry at the beginning of a meal. So the boys never got enough to eat. And also the food was sometimes pretty awful. So Orwell describes, for example, how if you had porridge, it was a good idea to search through it first for foreign bodies before you began eating it. On the plus side, he very much enjoyed walking on the downs and swimming. Now, this was clearly in the days before health and safety considerations, because they used to go swimming at Burling Gap, 
and also just below the lighthouse. And he describes how they were allowed to clamber over the rocks. They often came back cut and bruised and bleeding, but having had a good time. He loved going up to the dew ponds to search for newts. And also he particularly liked going on butterfly hunts because they had to take a train to do that. Now, interestingly, other people who went to St. Cyprian's say that Orwell overdid his complaints. And there is a school of thought that when he was writing this book, this short pamphlet, um, he was almost practicing for 1984. So dealing with a very authoritarian situation where your every move was watched and so on and so forth. I don't know if that's true or not, but this is a theory that has been put forward. But a couple of his other books definitely had connections with Eastbourne. So Coming Up for Air, for example, tells the story of a man, George Bowling, who's 45 years old. And it's in 1939. He was obviously involved in the 1914-18 war. And in fact, he was for a while at Summerdown Camp, which, as you know, was a convalescent camp for soldiers who'd been injured. And this fear of war in 1939 brings back his memories of 1914-18. And he decides to revisit the scenes of his childhood. And this is a quote from coming up for air, uh, which describes how the kids from the Slap Up Boys School in Eastbourne, this is St Cyprian's, used to be led round in crocodiles to hand out fags and peppermint creams to the wounded Tommies, as they called us. A pink-faced kid of about eight would walk up to a knot of wounded men sitting on the grass, split open a packet of woodbines and solemnly hand one fag to each man just like feeding the monkeys at the zoo. And in fact, this is one of the things that Orwell did do when he was at St. Cyprian's. Uh, the boys were encouraged to visit the men at the camp and to give them cigarettes, uh, but also to knit socks and hats for men at the front, which I think is quite a nice idea. Animal Farm is believed by some people, and in fact, there's a whole website devoted to this, to be based on Chalk Farm at Willingdon. And if you look at this website, it takes uh, passages from the book and says, well, we think this is here and we think this is there. And you know, the uh, windmill on the front cover of one of the early editions of Animal Farm looks just like Holgate Windmill and so on. But in the interests of fairness, I have to say that other people believe that it's based on Berry Farm in Wallington in Hertfordshire, near where Orwell lived with his first wife, Eileen. Now, another person who went to school in Eastbourne, but not to St Cyprian's, oh, sorry, before I go on to that, just to mention Gavin Maxwell, who did go to St Cyprian's, and most of you probably know him as the author of Ring of Bright Water. And you can see there's a picture of him there with an otter. He in 1956 toured the reed marshes in Iraq and he acquired this otter whom he called Mishbil and it turned out when he got this otter back to England that it was um, a species which at that time was unknown and it, in fact it was named after him so its second name is Maxwellia and a third author who went to St Cyprian's was Cyril Connolly who was a book reviewer literary critic and literary editor and critic and he was considered to be a favorite of Mrs Wilkes. He in fact returned to Eastbourne to live here in 1967. You can see at the bottom of this slide there's a blue plaque and this can be found in St John's Road in the Meads. Connolly wrote only one novel, The Rock Pool, but he was very famous for his quotes and one of his most famous quotes comes from a book he published in 1938 called The Enemies of Promise. There is no more somber enemy of good art than the pram in the hall. Some of you might have heard that quote before. Um, but Connolly also features in a number of other people's works. So he's mentioned, for example, in Alan Bennett, and one of the characters in Evelyn Moore's Sword of Honor trilogy is actually based on Cyril Connolly. 
But now I will come to the author who went to school in Eastbourne, but didn't go to St. Cyprian's, Noel Stretfield. Quite a lot of people, I think quite a lot of women in particular, will have read ballet school, ballet shoes, when they were children. And when I was preparing this talk, a number of people said to me that it was their favorite book as a child. It was only one of 28 children's books that she wrote, wrote and it has two main themes, which is careers and families. Noel Stratfield's books were very unusual at the time. This was the first children's book to feature a ballet school and to be based in central London. And most importantly, the heroines were professionals who aimed to earn a living. This was very, very unusual, and it was a very popular book. It sold nine million copies by 1967. Noel Stratfield was actually born in Surrey in 1895, and she was the second, and in her own words, most rebellious of five children. And her father, they moved to Eastbourne in 1911 when her father was appointed vicar of St Mary's in Eastbourne. This is the church right next to the Lamb, and he later became bishop of Lewis, and she went to school in Eastbourne, in Hastings, and in St Leonard's. In 1913, she went to the Eastbourne School of Domestic Economy, and she did munitions work at the Woolwich Arsenal in, from 1916, during the First World War. She wrote a fictionalised autobiographical series of novels called the Vicarage series, of which there are three, and the titles are there. And she wrote them as fiction because she said she found it very difficult to write in the first person. She found it much more comfortable to write in the third person. And they give a very good picture of what life was like in Eastbourne in the 1910s and the life that revolved around the parish and her father's work and so on and so forth. Noel Stretfield initially was not a writer. She actually studied at RADA and she became an actor and she became a successful actor. At one point she actually played opposite John Gilgood and she toured the UK, South Africa. She went to Australia, but realized that she was never going to be in the top flight. And she enrolled on a correspondence course in writing and published a short story and from there she moved into writing, first of all, adult novels. She wasn't very interested in writing children's books to begin with. Her adult fiction is very much based on her own experience. And she said she aimed to shock readers in the sense that it was, it was very realistic and it was not at all a happy family uh, picture that she painted. She was looking at a very uncertain post-war post -war world, this is post-First world, first world War initially, and families in uncertain situations. Now, those of you who know ballet shoes will know that it tells the story of three girls, Pauline, Petrova, and Posy Fossil, who are looked after by their great uncle Matthew, who's known as Gum, but he goes missing. And the children have to earn a living and they go to dance school and they become successful professionals, they tour and so on. What a lot of people don't know is that Ballet Shoes was a bowdlerized version of a much earlier novel, The Witch Arts, which was written for adults, which has three young girls, Mamie, Tanya and Daisy. But in this case, rather than being looked after by their great uncle Matthew, they are looked after by a one, young woman called Rose, who is the discarded mistress of a brigadier. And the three girls are daughters of three different affairs which the brigadier had. But as in ballet shoes, the girls go to dance school and they earn a living and they basically keep the family. And the reason that Noel Stretfield called it the witch arts is because none of the girls knew their father and they chose their adult name, their uh, family name rather, taken from the prayer, our father, which art in heaven, because as far as they were concerned, their father might as well have been in heaven because they knew nothing of him. 
Another novel of uh, Noel Stretfield's was Saplings, and this looks at the effect of war on children. It opens in Eastbourne, it opens on a family holiday in Eastbourne, a middle-class family with four children, and the father, Alex, uh, is killed in the war. And what Stretfield talks about very movingly is the impact that this had on the four children. It really, um, one of the boys in particular was very, very badly affected by his father's death. And it is quite a hard hitting novel uh, and very good read actually. So those are a number of authors, a number of authors who went to school in Eastbourne, who lived here as young people. But I'm now going to turn to an author who moved here as an adult. And this is Geoffrey Farnell. And he wrote, again, another very prolific author. He wrote more than 40 romance novels, many of which are set in Regency England. And together with Georgette Heyer, he largely initiated the Regency romance genre. So his novels were set in the period when Jane Austen was writing, and I'll come back to that later. Although he came to live in Eastbourne as an adult, he was actually born in Birmingham, spent a lot of his childhood in London and in Kent. He went to work in a foundry, but he was being repeatedly told off for not doing much work and writing in a notebook all the time because he was quite interested in writing. And at one point he came into fisticuffs with his supervisor who ended up lying on the floor and that was the end of his career in a foundry. As a boy, Geoffrey Farnell used to creep downstairs after he'd been sent to bed because his father used to read aloud to his mother and Farnell used to like to listen to the reading and he became acquainted with writers like Dickens and Trollope and so on. And this was what really inspired his interest in literature. He went to Westminster College of Art in 1900, without telling his parents, he married Blanche Hawley, who was a young woman, six, I think she was 16 years old. Her, she came from New York, so they moved to New York where Farnell worked as a scene painter. But in 1910, he returned to England and settled in Eastbourne in Denton Road, number 14 Denton Road. And again, there's a blue plaque there on the house. Um, in 1938, he was divorced from Blanche, and then he married Phyllis Clark. Now, Farnell's books are very swashbuckling. There's a lot of action. Uh, there's a lot of uh, fisticuffs. There's a lot of adventures. There's a lot of setbacks and people overcoming adversity and so on. According to Michael Partridge, his hero is brave and honourable the heroine innocent and beautiful, and the villain truly villainous. And E.S. Turner says his heroes are half chumps, half champs, not very bright. Heroines have soft, creamy throats, dimpled chins, scarlet lips, delicate noses, slim fingers, are light of foot, are sly bewitchers. And the broad highway has all of that in spades. It's an example of what was known as the open road genre. So this is a, a story where the hero goes on a journey, goes on an adventure. And the hero is Peter Vibart. Now he stands to inherit 500,000 pounds if he marries Lady Sophia Sefton. And she sounds like quite a character in her own right. She is reputed, for example, to have ridden her horse up and down the steps of St. Paul's Cathedral. However, this is not straightforward because Peter Vibart has, has a rival. His cousin, Sir Maurice Vibart, who's not a very good person, but Peter Vibart decides he's not going to get involved in this at all. He goes off with 10 guineas, which he very quickly loses, and he sets himself up as a blacksmith, and quite a large part of this part of the novel is set in Sissinghurst. Now, I mentioned that 
Farnell is writing about a period when Jane Austen was also writing, and I just want to put some of the sums into context. Peter Vibart stands to inherit £500,000 if he marries Lady Sophia Sefton. At that time, that would give you an income of £25,000 a year. Those of you who are fans of Jane Austen will know that Mr Darcy, who was considered so fabulously rich that he even silenced Mrs Bennet, his income was £10,000 a year. In other words, this inheritance would give Peter Vibart two and a half times Mr Darcy's income. So he ends up in Sissinghurst, although it's not called that in the book, uh, working as a blacksmith, and he gives shelter to a young woman called Charmian Brown, who is basically trying to hide from Maurice Vibart. What the reader realises quite quickly, but it takes Peter Vibart considerably longer to realise this, is that this is in fact Lady Sophia Sefton. And to cut a long story short, uh, he sees off Sir Maurice Vibart, they end up getting married, and it all ends happily. The amateur gentleman is almost the opposite because uh, this features John Barty, who is the son of an ex prize fighter, the England champion, boxing champion, and a publican. And John inherits £700,000, so even more, and he decides to become a gentleman and he moves to London. On his first day, he manages to rescue two damsels in distress and to get into fisticuffs. So quite a, a eventful day. He, he goes to London, he moves in high society, and the pinnacle of this is he ends up having being at a dinner with the Prince Regent. But he's then exposed by some of the enemies that he's made on the way. And he ends up going back to his village and marrying the Lady Cleone, who is one of the damsels that he rescued in the early part of the book. Now, an amateur gentleman introduces a character called Jasper Shrig, who is the iron-hatted Bow Street runner. And it's literally iron-hatted because he's got a, a ring of metal inside his hat, which protects him and he can also use it as a weapon. And this was the first in a series featuring him. I think it was 10 books that uh, Farnell wrote about Jasper Shrew. Okay. Now the broad highway was extremely popular. Geoffrey Farnell made 40,000 pounds from it. And um, remember that it was written in the early 20th century. So that was a considerable amount of money. And it was, it was particularly popular among soldiers in the First World War. And he got a lot of letters from soldiers who'd been reading it. And there's a rather moving quote here from uh, a second lieutenant in the Royal Engineers who was in Egypt. And he writes, I won't read it out because it's very long and it's tedious for me to read it out. But he writes about how, you know, the conditions were so hard. It was so hot. Uh, they were obviously under, under pressure all the time. They were probably in fear of their lives. But he describes how in the evening, he sits down with his broad highway. And as it says towards the end of the quote, it restores his jaded nerves. And I'm once again cheery and good tempered. And the book awakens, even as Dickens works do, the desire to leave a world better than one found it. It must have been fantastic for Farnell to get those sorts of letters from soldiers. Another one he received, and this incident could come straight out of one of his books, was from a New Zealander who was uh, told that his regiment was moving to the Dardanelles. And of course, we all know what happened in Gallipoli, particularly to the Anzac soldiers there. But the soldiers were told that they could only take necessities with them. They had to travel light. This soldier decided that the broad highway was a necessity because he hadn't finished it. And he describes how he had it tucked inside his jacket 
when he was hit by a piece of shrapnel and the book actually protected him and saved him from being wounded. So as I say, this is an incident which could have come straight out of one of Barnell's books. I'm now going to move to a contemporary author, James Lovegrove, who was born in 1965 and who lives in Eastbourne. And again, another very prolific author, who has written over 50 books for children, young adults and adults. Um, he wrote, uh, I suppose you could call it experimental science fiction books, and he won a number of awards for his early books. But his books include a Sherlock Holmes series, and I've, I've got a picture here of one of them, The Gods of War, because this I think will be of interest to you because it's actually set in Eastbourne. Sherlock Holmes by this time is living in retirement in his cottage in Eastdean, and those of you who know Eastdean will know the cottage with the blue plaque on it, saying Sherlock Holmes lived here. And the book opens at Eastbourne Station Dr. Watson is arriving from London because he's been asked by Holmes to come and help him investigate a robbery at Barraclough's jewellers. They solve that quite quickly, as you can imagine, uh, but they go for a walk on the beach and they encounter a body. And of course, Sherlock Holmes becomes interested in this. Now there's a lovely quote here from the book the Winnicks were a group of fishermen who lived near, I think it was Beachy Head, and they're looking at the body when Holmes and Watson arrived, and they have this conversation. And if you read it through, you probably haven't got a clue what it's talking about. But actually what they're talking about is mud, and the different kinds of mud that you find in the area. And the fact that the mud, the body was found on the beach, but the mud on the body is the kind of mud that you find further out. And so that immediately raises Sherlock Holmes' suspicions. As I say, it's set in Eastbourne. There's some wonderful scenes. Dr. Watson at one point is pushed off the pier, but he's rescued by the Endurance Swimmers Club, who are swimming en route to swimming to Pevensey. The cottage in Eastbourne is besieged. Uh, there's references in the book to the Tiger Inn. They have lunch at the Tiger Inn. Uh, quite a few references to South Street. One of the characters has a shop there. It also mentions the Masonic Hall in South Street and also the synagogue in Susan's Road. And also the flying schools, which were set up in the area by Vickers and by Sopwith and Hewitt and Blondine. So if you like Sherlock Holmes and you're interested in reading about Eastbourne and you like a good adventure, this is definitely the book for you. Now I'm going to finish the talk by talking about some literary visitors, people who came to stay in Eastbourne, some of them on a regular basis and some of them very occasionally. And I'm going to start at the top left-hand corner with Charles Dickens. Now, the reason I'm mentioning Dickens is because those of you who know Borough Lane, which is um, opposite Gildridge Manor and on the other side of the road from Waitrose and the Lamb Inn, will know that there's a blue plaque there on a house that says that Dickens came to stay. Now, I have to say there is no solid evidence that this is actually the case, but I have to mention it because the blue plaque is there. But one person who definitely came to stay was Mabel Lucy Atwell, and she came regularly to stay here for holidays. On the top right hand side, we've got Frederick Engels. Anyone who reads the Eastbourne Herald will know there's been a correspondence recently he had a holiday home near the pier and apparently there used to be a plaque on the house which was vandalised and removed and there's been a correspondence recently in the Eastbourne Herald about actually replacing it. Now Engels of course is best known for writing the Communist Manifesto, Manifesto with Karl Marx uh, but he wrote a number of other things including a book called The Condition of the English Working Classes in 1844, which talked about the conditions of the mill workers, many of them Irish immigrants, in Manchester in the 19th century. 
he loved Eastbourne and his ashes were scattered off uh, Beachy Head. I should have mentioned, by the way, that Geoffrey Farnell's ashes were scattered at the head of the Long Man of Warmington. In the bottom right hand corner, we have Jane Austen. Now, again, there's no evidence, no solid evidence that Jane Austen did come to Eastbourne. But some people say that her book Sanditon, which is an unfinished book, was based on Eastbourne. Other people say it's based on uh, Seaford and other people lay claims to other areas and so on. But as I say, no solid evidence. And in the middle, we have Harold Pinter and Lady Antonia Fraser, both of them writers, who like to come and spend weekends at the Grand Hotel in Eastbourne. And then finally, at the bottom right hand, bottom left hand corner, a blue plaque to Lewis Carroll, who came and spent many summers in a house in Lushington Road. So as I said at the beginning, quite a few to choose from, quite a lot of writers who have connections with Eastbourne or who have written about Eastbourne. I'm sorry if I've left out your favourite author, but I hope what I've done is perhaps stimulated you to follow up some of these leads. And in conclusion, I would say, happy reading. Thank you.